<laughs> would you open your Bibles with me this morning as we kind of hit the reset button a little bit this morning and uh, touch base again with what is it that God has called us as a body of believers to be about? What is it that he has given us as a mission to accomplish, as a mission to join him in? Because I do not believe ever that God gave somebody a job and was like, well, you know, good luck with that. Have a good time. He never has done that. It's always been his mission. It's always been his plan. It's always been what he has already been at work accomplishing. And then he calls people to join him in it. And that is literally what has happened with us as a body of believers. That God has been about repossessing Tucson and all of southern Arizona for far longer than the 10-year history of our church. You've got to understand that the historically 200-ish years ago, missionaries started coming to this valley to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. And there were all kinds of things that came along with it, but that was God's intent, was to come and share the good news. And we have been called to join Him in that. And the way we have been called to join Him in that is what we're going to be taking a look at over the course of the next couple of weeks, okay? And so uh, I, I want this to kind of be something that just wiggles into your brain, finds a good deep spot to dig into, and just grows there. Because this is who we as a church are. And uh, I, I had this week a conversation with a couple who uh, indicated that they were interested in membership. And the way we do membership uh, is really interesting to me, at least. We don't push membership. It's not something you, you don't have to be a member to come and enjoy the ministry and be part of the ministry of my church. Uh, but if you want to identify yourself with us, then membership is a wonderful thing. And, and as we go through that, the only time I really do a membership class is either if somebody asks about membership or if, if our, our annual church conference is coming up. And so we just had one back in May, but we had another couple that has come and said, hey, we're interested in membership. We want to know what that means. We want to know what that looks like. So we'll have a date set for you by next Sunday. So you can, if you're interested in, in finding out what that means, then great. You can come be part of that. But this is really who we are. And if you're going to join us in what God has called us to be about, then you probably, strangely, ought to know what we're about. Right? That, that going through this reality of being part of a body of believers that we call the church, there is something that we do that is not just gather together on Sunday morning. We are involved in actually doing something that is far bigger than just having a church service on Sunday or two. It's far bigger than just working on building a building. It is far bigger than just you know, hey, I have a place that I go that I worship God. It is way more than that because God has called us to repossess Tucson and all of southern Arizona starting right here in Sarita in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is a big mission. That's something that the reality is, I'm getting old, I know that, but I will most likely be dead <laughs> by the time this mission is maybe fully accomplished. I don't know. This is, a, this is a big thing. So how are we getting from where we're at today to really going after that? And we do that in a few ways. One is through church planting. We planted a church down in Rio Rico, who also then planted a church down in Nogales. And that is part of repossessing Tucson and all of southern Arizona. We've, uh, we've partnered with a couple of other churches to plant a church out in, in uh, Red Rock. We want to ultimately become a church ourselves that is a sending church that says, hey, we want to plant a church in downtown Tucson, who's in? Who wants to say, I will dedicate a year of my life minimum to go to Tucson for church, to get that thing started? That's something that we're looking at. That's the next kind of, for me, the next area where it's like, man, I think God wants a vibrant Christian community in downtown Tucson that is reaching downtown Tucson for Jesus Christ. The reality is, my church, us here right now, we're not going to be that church. But we can plant that church. And so that is part of this process of repossessing Tucson and all of southern Arizona starting right here in Sarita. That Yes, I believe that God is going to continue to build us in healthy ways that prepare us to be able to say, you know what, I'm glad you enjoy being here. But maybe God is calling you 
to join him personally in the mission of repossessing Tucson. And maybe that's in the downtown church when that happens, or maybe that's in another church. Maybe you come from a place that's like 20 minutes away and you're like, man, I wish there was a church close, but I love this church, so I drive over here. Great, let's plant a church there too. Let's repossess Tucson and all of Southern Arizona starting right here. Now, the way we go about that, who we are and kind of how we function or, or what we're kind of going to look at over the course of the next few weeks. So if you'd open your Bibles, we are going to be running through Matthew chapter 28 and, and a little bit of verse 10 today as well. Uh, so join me here in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. Uh, Jesus says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Who gave him that authority? Wait, wait, wait. Let's back up. Who offered him dominion? Do you remember that part of Scripture? Satan tried to offer him something that ultimately, long-term, wasn't even Satan's to offer, but Satan had a huge level of control. And this conversation, if you remember that part, Jesus never said, Satan, you don't have dominion. Well, absolutely. Sin had huge, immense power at that time. And Jesus had not yet conquered sin and death. The reality of that conversation is really absolutely just interesting to me. But now, this is after the resurrection, I have been given all authority. What Satan wanted to give him was, I'll give you authority here, but you still, like, you're under my authority is what Satan wanted to do. But no, 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 no. Jesus laid his life down, died for our sin, rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death, and what God gave Jesus was not some authority, all authority. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. See, that is right there a general call for all Christians. This isn't like, you know what, somebody else is called to make disciples. It's not my gift. I don't have the gift of disciple making. If you have given yourself that excuse, see me afterwards. I'm a big fan of saying this, though I've never yet done it, so you don't have to really live in fear. But if you have given yourself permission to not make disciples, and you think that's somebody else's job, see me afterwards, I'll slap you. You're wrong. You're wrong. We are all, as disciples, if we count ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ, then we have got to be passing on what we know and giving the gift that we have of the good news to other people. We have to be doing that. That's not optional. Jesus didn't give any caveats here like, if you're not really a people person, this doesn't apply to you. But if you're outgoing, then go and make... Did he say that? No, he didn't say that at all. He told all of his disciples, all of them that were there, of varying different personalities and backgrounds, he gave them all the same commission. This is the general call for all Christians. Then we are given this specific call, kind of a more detailed call. If you go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 through 20, it's, uh, we're not going to cover all the way through 20. We're going to kind of go through 14. It says this, Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Don't take any money with you in your money belts. No gold, silver, or even copper coins. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes or sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Whenever you enter a city or village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it is not, take back the blessing. If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. Now this is uh, Jesus' instruction to his disciples as he sends them out kind of on their first try at evangelizing, at kind of getting more people to follow Jesus. They hadn't done it before. And he gives them these specific instructions. This is really interesting to me because there's some things in this passage that, uh, that as Jesus says them, they 
might fall on deaf ears for us here in America today. Would you ever go anywhere without your debit card? I mean, can you, like, fathom that reality? Like, we, as a church, we, we went to skate country yesterday. We had, like, 60 people there, plus some other people that, that didn't um, skate, so they didn't have to pay. So we, but we had a tally of about six. I think it was 59 total that, that we, we skated together. We had a great time. Did any of you go expecting that somebody else was going to pay for you? I mean, no, not really. Not unless it was prearranged. <laughs> you didn't walk out like, you know what, I want to go be with God's people, and I trust that God's going to take care of me, so I'm not even going to take skates. I'm not going to take any, any money with me. I'm just going to go mooch off of everybody that's there. I mean, we don't even have a spot in our brain to plan like that. And that's exactly what Jesus told his disciples to do, which is very strange to me. Why? What what in this instruction that Jesus gave, what does it do? What does it accomplish that if you go out joining Jesus in the call that he has put on you, unprepared, but looking for opportunity for somebody else to help you, doesn't that sound like you'll accomplish absolutely nothing for Jesus? And yet, this is the exact instruction that Jesus gave his disciples. Why? It goes directly against kind of our American think and mainly our independence that, no, I won't, I won't rely on anybody else. I can take care of myself. Thank you very much. I'm supposed to take care of myself. That's the way it is supposed to be. And I, I don't disagree with that in, in part, but Jesus says something very, very different. And this truth that Jesus lays out, the way Jesus says to remove barriers is to share needs. You get that? This is where your notes start, if you have your notes. If you're a note taker, take them out. Turn to whatever page that's on in your bulletin there and start filling that in. The way Jesus says to remove barriers is to share your needs. This is so weird, right? But let's break that down because if you think about this, this is exactly today how we actually build relationships. When you don't share your needs, how much help do you get? None. I don't know if you, you, you know this, but uh, and I might be jumping out of... Out of uh, order here, David, so follow me with this. Um, if you have been on Facebook at all or you read the Street of Sun or anything like that, we had a fire at the church property, okay? Um, somebody started it. We don't know who. There's no, nothing, they haven't found anything on that yet other than a fire. That's what we found. Uh, that's what indicated that somebody set a fire. It's really weird how that works out. Um, but uh, it was interesting. Got to go out there. Are there any of those pictures that you have there, David? Yeah. All right, you, if you see, they're super, super high definition. Why? Because they're taken on my phone. Um, but uh, uh, you see the guys here straight back through there. Uh, everything white back there looks like it might be clouds in the distance. No, that's smoke. They're actually back there dealing with the fire. Keep going on this. Um, we just had, uh, this was the most exciting thing that's happened on the property in a very long time, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and I was out there like, I'm a nerd. Um, and they looked at me like I was a nerd, which was really cool. Uh, keep going. Uh, so directly in the middle is where the fire was. This is, if you've been out to the property, this is the south house. What is amazing to me is that uh, our plan for that south house is really, really important. We're going to bulldoze it, all right? Um, so I was just crying the whole time, like, no, not the house. We're gonna... I was like, let it burn. Um, <laughs> But apparently they don't do that because they're firemen. Um, now, if there's firemen in here, I know you guys are the biggest pyromaniacs in the world, so I don't know why you put fires out instead of just watching them, but that's all right. 
It's okay. Um, but they did a great job. The, the uh, rural metro and Sarita PD were out there, and the Sarita PD had this really awesome drone, which I won't get into, but it was cool. All right. Um, but uh, through this whole thing, they're, they're, now we have a need. What is that need? Well, now we've got to we got to get back out there and board up something that just burned down because now it's a public safety hazard, right? And how would you know about that if I didn't tell you about that? Well, we read it. And, well, did you know that we need to get out there and board it up? I got to do that tomorrow. Who wants to help? Sweet, 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 sweet. I got four guys. We're good. Excellent. All right. So I'm not joking. Talk to me afterwards. We'll get set up. All right. But if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't have help right now if I didn't ask. And so this, this thing that feels counterintuitive, like I'm supposed to go prepared, I'm supposed to take care of myself so that I'm not a burden on other people. That's our American think. And so what Jesus says sounds completely wrong. That we're supposed to go and ask for help where we go. Like, hey, I need a place to live. Hey, I need food. Hey. I need shoes because my sandals just broke because I didn't bring another pair because Jesus said not to. And this really begins to, this, this shows the brilliance of our creator. That he knows us better than we know ourselves. That when we are in need, we have opportunity for conversations that we would never have had if we live independently. Ever. That if I will share, this is, if, if you're having trouble making connections with other Christians, I challenge you with this. Have you shared your needs? Have you communicated to somebody else? This is what's going on in my life, and it's weird. I know Pastor Dusty told us we're supposed to like share our needs, so here it goes. I want to try to handle these things myself, but I need this. And... I just want to open my life up. I want, I want somebody to know me well enough. I want to be able to tell somebody. I want to be vulnerable enough to say this is a need that I have. And I promise you this, conversations you never would have had will come when we start removing barriers in other people's lives by asking them for help. Here's the thing. And this was something that uh, a guy named Jimmy Johnson uh, spoke about Literally, it was the, the weekend or the, the week in camp that I got called into ministry before my junior year of high school. He was talking about this reality of, of going at, like, I, I'm not just going to help my neighbors to build relationships with them. I'm going to ask them for help. You mean burdening your neighbors with your problems builds relationships? Yeah. Like, I'm a tool guy. I hate not having the right, do I have any other guys that hate not having the right tool? Anybody? Yes. And so over the course of my 42 years now, I have built this collection of tools that I use maybe once a year if I'm super lucky, right? But you know what? When I need it, guess what? Sucker, I have it. And I don't need to ask my neighbor because my neighbor comes and asks me because I'm the, the tool guy. And that's it. That's, that's how I roll. And that's me. And that means that my neighbors are always in debt to me, which always sets up this weird, like, oh, I asked them for a favor last time, so I don't want to talk to them again because I haven't paid that favor back. But when we put ourselves in debt, and I'm talking not financial debt, I'm talking about like favor debt, like you owe me one. Cool. But when we're in the position of I owe you one, then you can come and ask me for anything anytime. And now we have this next level conversation going on that, hey, you helped me out. If there's anything I can do from here on out, I'm at your disposal. And now there's this lowering of barriers, this lowering of weirdness between neighbors, between friends, between anybody, workers, co-workers, that if I am in debt to somebody else, they can come to me and they don't feel like they're asking for a favor. It's just getting level again. 
Now, this is something I'm not good at. I'm just sharing with you that this is exactly what Jesus said, and we need to practice this in order for it to be a reality in our lives, that not only am I going to be a good neighbor by helping my neighbors, but I'm going to ask my neighbor for help when it's time that I need help, because that will remove a barrier. We as a church, the first thing, the, the, the way that we go about repossessing Tucson and all of southern Arizona starting right here in Sarita is removing barriers, loving God and people, and serving and giving together. It's really hard to do those out of that order. I'll just tell you that. And that's why they're in that order that if there's barriers between myself and other people, that means it's hard for me to show them the love of Jesus Christ. And so what do I need to do first? Do I need to just power through that barrier with the love of Jesus? I'm like, Jesus loves you really a lot. Okay, don't talk to the neighbor, they're weird. Like, or let's remove the barrier first so that the guard is down, so that when I want to show the love of Jesus Christ, it's readily received. Do you guys know why we don't shake elbows instead of hands when we greet each other? Do I have any law enforcement in the house today? Raise your hand if you're law enforcement. Cool. If I, uh, if I came to you like this, what do you think? You might get shot. Yeah. We don't, we don't greet each other with our elbows because I can hide a lot of things if my elbows are coming first. We greet each other with open hands. And with the people we love, we greet each other with open arms. Why? What does this show you? You're I am unarmed. I am not a danger to you that I am leaving myself open to you. Nothing in my hands. All my soft bits, vital portions are really open. I have a position, a posture of openness. This is removing barriers. This is, this, and I'm not saying go hug all your neighbors and show them that you don't have any guns. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying the way we live our life, the way we communicate that I don't want there to be a barrier between you and me is most easily done, and Jesus showed his disciples that here, is to go and have a need. Why? Because God knows he built it into us that when we see somebody else with a need, we actually have to make a decision to not see that need and fulfill it. You see the guy on the side of the road asking for money. You have to make a decision. Your heart that God built into you, the image of God that still resides in you, even if you're a complete jerk, you see him, and you have in that moment an opportunity to make a decision. Am I going to look away and like fiddle with the radio because I don't want to make eye contact and like check the back seat? And boop, boop, green light. <laughs> because you see that need, and God has built into us a reality. Now, our sinfulness has trained us extremely well to not fulfill a lot of needs. But the reality is that we were designed by God to meet each other's needs, to take care of each other. It is sin that has broken that, but that image of God still re remains in us. And, and our, on our best days when we are following God and when we are saying, man, there are needs around me and I'm going to be open to those needs and I'm going to fulfill as many of those needs as I can, but I'm also going to open up my life and show people my needs so that I can attract them to me so that they can see Jesus in me. This reality of removing barriers is what Jesus was teaching his disciples by saying, don't take an extra cloak, don't take any money with you, don't take extra sandals, just go and share your need and see what conversations come out of that. If you were going along with us there, the, the next uh, fill in the blanks, we're going to be dealing with these a little bit more as, as the weeks go on here. Uh, removing barriers, loving God and people, and serving and giving together. Why? We do this so that we can accomplish the mission that God has called us to. We are going through this, and we're going to touch base on these a little bit more as we go through the next weeks, but I want you to know at the beginning of this kind of school year, because this is really kind of the start of life for us in Sarita. It, it, it isn't like 
January 1st. It's not the calendar year for us. It really is very much, especially those of us who have kids in school, life just got back to normal this last week. And so at the beginning, there's these transition times that I do want you to understand who we are and what God has called us to be because He is sending you, whether you take your kids to school or drop them at a bus stop or just hug them and push them out the door, however, you have these opportunities, <laughs> you have opportunities new and fresh with new people to remove barriers. What are you going to do with that, those opportunities? How are you going to open your life up? Or are you going to say, no, I'm good. I got it. We got it under control. See, our house is in order. We're awesome. It's all in our backyard, okay? So it's all under control. <laughs> we don't need you. What does that say? I mean, if literally, when you hear that out of somebody else's mouth, what do you think of them? Pompous jerk. Didn't want to be in community with you anyway. But if we will open ourselves up and share the needs that we have, then God's going to give us some opportunities. What if removing barriers is supposed to start with us? James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. John chapter 15, verse 27 says this, And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. You see, this, this opening up of ourselves and becoming vulnerable with the people around us, that is how we remove barriers. You do not argue barriers down. Do you, you get that? That if somebody has a problem with Jesus or they have a problem with other Christians and they say, oh, all Christians are hypocrites, and you're like, no, we're not. I'm going to prove to you 18 points why. Here's my PowerPoint. Tick, 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 tick. Does that ever, like, brought somebody to Jesus? No. But when we open up our lives and say, hey, you know what? I've got this tree that blew down in the monsoon the other night. Would you come help me? They'll probably be like, oh, it's so hot, but sure. You're my neighbor, I'll help you out. And then what do you have? You have two hours to have conversation with that person and share the love of Jesus Christ with them and free labor. So there you go. <laughs> you, when we share needs, we are removing barriers. I'm not saying you have to have the answers for everybody's questions. Please understand that when I say we are removing barriers, I'm not expecting you to have answers for everybody's questions. I am saying that you can share your life and open yourself up and be vulnerable and have needs and communicate those needs while also fulfilling other people's needs. And in so doing, barriers get removed. And then we're one step closer to accomplishing the mission that God has called us as a body of believers to be about because he has called you to be a part of this body. And if that's the case, then removing barriers isn't the church's job. It's your job. To be living in relationships in such a way that people can get to know you, and as they get to know you, they will see Jesus Christ in you. That's the plan. Does that make sense to you? All right. Going to keep going, wrap up uh, some of your notes there, so if, if you've got those... Uh, Removing barriers equals this, intentionally taking your guard down. The second one is being real with yourself. We can lie to ourselves and say everything's okay, I've got it all under control, when it's not. But we need to be real with ourselves. And then share weakness and pain. When was the last time you actually told somebody how your day was going? Not like, oh, it's a good day, thank you. How was your day? Oh, good? Oh, good. But like, actually share. And I'm stressed out about a decision at work, about my job, about whether I'm moving or whether we're staying. Or I'm stressed out about this. I don't, I'm not expecting you to have an answer. I just wanted to share with you. You're opening yourself up. Share weakness and pain. Fourth one is this. Admit your needs to yourself and to other people. And then... Don't always just be Debbie Downer to try to get people to come closer to you, all right? Also share the victories. When you share that there's a need and somebody helps you with that, then share that victory. 
Share with other people, hey, God has provided amazingly in this area. How many times have you given testimony? And I'm not talking about like, Jesus saved me. Just tell people that Jesus has provided for you somehow. That's testimony as well. When was the last time you did that? You see, all of these are things that are necessary in this removing of barriers thing. That if you've already opened yourself up and you've shared a need with somebody else, then you have this rapport, this relationship, that then you also get to say, man, you would not believe this, but this is what happened. So let me share some of the victories that God has given us as a church and some of the needs, all right? And the, the building committee, uh, you guys met this morning at 7.30, correct? Was praying for you on that. Um, I'll get a report later, I won't ask now. But the building committee met out at the property this morning at 7.30, did a little walk around. I'm not sure about everything they talked about, but I'm assuming that they prayed a little bit and talked to God about that stuff too. But the building committee is walking through the process of getting ready to present to the whole body of, of, of the church here, this is where we're at, this is where we're going, these are the needs. That's going to be coming, so just, you know, be aware and be ready for that as it comes. But let me tell you about some of the things that God has already accomplished, what He's already done. All right, we, the, the property that we have, the, the pictures that we showed you, if you've never been out there, it's a beautiful piece of property. It's right here in Rancho, on the north end of, of Rancho Sarita here. But uh, that property originally, the asking price was $2.4 million for that property. And I, for those of you that have heard this eight times before, it's great that you're here. Thank you. For those that have never heard this before, I want you to know what God has been doing. They wanted $2.4 million for that in 2006 when we moved here. Guess how much money I had at the time? $2.4. <laughs> About that, right? <laughs> I mean, like, just enough to drive home, basically. Like, that was it. So $2.4 million was like, cool, do you have any property on Mars? Because I could buy that and do as much with that as I could here because I'll never be able to do anything else. Because we didn't even have a church at that point. $2.4 million. If you've ever tried to count that high, you got older in that process. But that is, that's just a, that's a crazy amount of money, but that's kind of what the prices were back then. That wasn't out of the norm. And then this little thing happened in 2008 where your house and my house went <laughs> just like that. As did property prices. And guess what? We ended up getting that in, I believe it was 2008 is when we got it. So maybe... No, it was 2009 that we got it. We got it for $240,000. That is one-tenth. A tithe, you say? Yeah, I mean, God took care of the 90, and he's like, hey, you guys willing to, like, take care of 10? You want to join me in this process? Cool, I'll take care of a lot of it. And so God caused the entire U.S. economy to tank for us. <laughs> 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 I don't think that's what happened, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but that's huge. And then our district and our denomination kicked in $100,000. We, as a church, bought 8.6 acres of property for $140,000. I'm going to praise God for that all the time. That's huge. And everything since then has gone so smoothly. <laughs> no. I mean, the, the struggles were real, and we had to share those to have people that knew how to deal with those struggles even go, hey, I can help with that. That, man, easements? Did you know that your house has an easement? That the only reason you have access to your front door and your garage is because you have an easement? Did you know that they don't teach that at pastor school? <laughs> I had no idea about these things. And it took years of wrestling with these easement issues and hiring lawyers that did so much. But cost really so much. That's not joking. And so going through this process, it has not been easy, but God has been in it. He has blessed us with this piece of property. We've been working through this process, and now we have this thing that has gone to the building committee to say, hey, that we've developed a lot of plans. Let's get those plans in front of the building committee so it can be in front of the whole church, so the whole church can say, yeah, 
I like that, let's move forward, or who, what, what, have you thought about this? Have you looked at that? So that we as a whole body of believers can together move forward, because so far it's kind of been a smaller group that has been involved with this, and that's sometimes just necessary. But the reality is, there's going to be a lot coming at you as far as information, as far as things that you can buy into and get behind, and we'll be asking, how can you help with this? Because guess what? I still don't have $2.4 million. Shocking, I know. <laughs> but this isn't my church. When God looks at us, he says, that is my church. And so I want, I'm expecting God to do some amazing things, but I've also been praying for you guys over the course of the last 10 years. God, bless the people that are part of this church, not just so they're blessed, so that they can bless others. Do you realize that the reason we are here today is because other people sacrificed to make this church a reality? Do you realize that the seat that you're sitting in was not set up magically by angels? That somebody came early this morning and sacrificed of their time to put those chairs up, to put this whole stage together, to put everything in here. Everything that you get to enjoy has come out of the sacrifice of someone else. I want future generations and future churches to be able to enjoy the presence of Jesus Christ because we as a church sacrifice to bring about the will of Jesus Christ, which is repossessing Tucson and all of southern Arizona starting right here in Sarita. God's been doing amazing stuff. He is doing amazing stuff right now. He is calling you to be part of that. And that starts with removing barriers. Let's pray. God, you are good. Thank you for these really strange instructions you gave your disciples. And as your disciples still, God, we receive that instruction. And we say, Lord, what do I do with that? How do I properly answer your call to remove barriers? Lord, I pray that this week we would be willing to open our lives up and share just one need with somebody else and see what happens when we open our life up in that way. See what barriers you begin to remove between ourselves and other people. And as you remove those barriers as you give opportunity for relationship to be built, then, Father, I pray that your kingdom would expand, that new hearts and lives would be shown your love and your salvation, that the gospel would continue to go out, that we would be able to share that, man, I once was lost, but now I'm found because Jesus Christ has saved me. God, we look forward to opportunities this week Continue to break our hearts for those in our community that don't yet know you, those who are farthest from you, God. And Lord, as you continue to give us this kind of instruction that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to our common way of thinking, God, you are rewiring us. So Lord, help us follow these instructions this week to go out into our community with a need to share that maybe with our neighbor or our coworker, or maybe just in our own house, Lord, that men here would share their needs with their wife and that wives would share their need with their husband so that, God, more barriers fall and more relationship is built and more evidence of you is given every single day. Lord, you are good. We thank you for how you have taken care of us as a church. Thank you for how you've taken care of us individually. And Lord, we come to you saying thank you. God, you are so good. We don't just ask things from you. We want to bless you. And so Lord, as we continue in worship, we want to give our offerings to you. To say, God, everything I am is yours. But Lord, also, I want to give of my time. I want to give of my energy. I want to give of the resources that you have blessed me with. And so Lord... We give you our worship, we give you our praise, we give you our offerings now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.